During the last two months of the Second World War in Europe, the US Army Air Force's front line, the P-47 Thunderbolt fighter pilots, was the subject of a unique color film made on the orders of the highest American Air Force General, Hap Arnold. 16 US Air Force camera crews would live alongside them, filming their takeoffs and landings, their everyday lives, and their deaths. This is their story of the final battle of the war, the conquest of the Reich. In the early spring of 1945, the fighter pilots of the US Army Air Force in Europe were recovering from the biggest battle in American military history, the Battle of the Bulge. Their losses had been enormous in both men and equipment. Replacement pilots and new planes arrived daily to fill the depleted ranks. P-47 Thunderbolt fighter groups were operating from captured German Luftwaffe air bases just miles from the front lines with a new mission to provide air support for the Army's advance into Germany. The Thunderbolts were some of the fastest and most powerful fighter planes in the world, reaching speeds of almost 600 miles per hour in one dive. Their pilots were some of the best, Seven out of the top ten American fighter aces in Europe flew Thunderbolts. Flying without pressure suits, only strong young men could withstand the forces of gravity built up after a steep dive. They were all tough, well-trained, and their morale was high. In March 1945, Arthur Davis was a replacement pilot assigned to the 362nd Fighter Group based in eastern France, near the German border. They were all about the same age I was in my early 20s, 23, 24, something like that. And uh, there were very few, uh, a couple of guys that were almost 30, and we call them grandfather, that sort of thing. But there were fellows younger than I was. The morale was high. As a matter of fact, I was a little surprised because uh, they have always experienced several casualties over a period of time. And uh, I was a replacement for someone who had been, been killed in action. And uh, I was expecting something other than that, but the morale was very high. A fighter group consisted of three squadrons, each containing 16 planes and 25 pilots. Maintaining a 48-plane Thunderbolt fighter group required long supply lines, 75 pilots, and 1,200 ground crew personnel. Meteorologists and operation officers, radio and radar operators, anti-aircraft gunners, fuel supply and distribution systems, runway construction and maintenance engineers. Each plane in the group needed a crew of 25 men just to keep it flying, and work went on around the clock. The P-47 Thunderbolt was the biggest, heaviest, and most powerful single-engine fighter ever built at the time, considered by its pilots to be almost as tough as a tank and as difficult to destroy. With its 2400 horsepower engine, it weighed almost eight tons fully loaded. Every plane carried a film camera in the wing, timed to operate automatically with the gun trigger. Many frontline fighter planes were flying three missions a day, and keeping these planes in the air required close coordination between every man in the group. The confidence of the pilots in their ground crew was essential, any overlooked detail could cost them their lives. 23-year-old Ken Bullock flew 46 combat missions in Thunderbolts during the last months of the war. 
You know, there were uh, supposed to be some rules about fraternizing with the enlisted men and all that stuff. That went out the window the minute we joined the squadron. We were all in there together. It didn't matter if you were a private or a colonel. You were all on the same team. You knew each other. I mean, you showed respect, don't get me wrong, but the, the people really worked together. You talk about cooperation and communication, it was there. And I am so proud to be a part of that. We liberated a, uh, a supply dump or something full of Mercedes convertibles. And uh, it turned out that almost every pilot in the 377th had his own convertible. By March 1945, the mission of the P-47s had changed from bomber escort to close air support for the advancing ground troops and armor. Flying attacks from as low as 50 feet were costing many pilots' lives. A new man joining a Thunderbolt group at this time in the war had a life expectancy of just two missions. With more than 100 combat missions behind them, some squadron commanding officers had reached the rank of major, many by the age of 24. In the last air battle over Germany, they would lead their men into the cockpits and down the runway. Almost half of these pilots filmed, both veteran and new replacements alike, would be casualties 10 weeks later when the war ended. The coming battle would take place over one of the greatest natural defense obstacles in Europe, the Rhine River. No foreign army had crossed the Rhine into Germany in 150 years. The battle would last for three weeks. All Thunderbolts were now flying three combat missions a day. 22-year-old Lieutenant Paul O'Dell was a veteran of 45 combat missions, many of them over the Rhine. And they would have a crew chief and the assistant there. They would get us up in the plane. Then uh, naturally we had to start the plane up in that area and have the crew chief get on a wing because we had a taxi out over chicken wire and straw and he had to guide us along because we couldn't weave back and forth to see where we were going. So then we would finally get to the end of the runway and we'd get lined up in the, you know, we'd get lined up in position or takeoff position depending on where we were in the flight. Well, when you're on the flight line ready to take off, I mean, some things go through your mind. Uh, I think my own particular deal, I, you felt kind of invincible, so you weren't really expecting anything to happen to you, and uh, so it didn't really prey on your mind that much. The day began at 3.30 in the morning when pilots were woken for the daily briefing, and at dawn, the engines would start. Besides the throttle, you had the supercharger had to be opened up with it because they give you an extra horsepower to get the thing off the ground, especially if it was loaded, heavily loaded with bombs. Main thought was to keep the plane straight going down the runway and get in the air and go do your job and come back. You didn't think about being killed. Takeoff is a marvelous feeling because uh, you have full control of an over 2,000 horsepower engine. And when you put that throttle to the firewall, we call it, it's all the way forward, you've got all the power you need to take off. And it, it thrusts you back in your seat, hard against the crash pad in the back. And you know that you're gonna go up and fly. the conquest of the Reich was about to begin. March 1945. Within a few weeks of having cameras installed in the wings of their planes, America's Thunderbolt fighters would face their biggest strike to date. 
the Luftwaffe air bases along Germany's River Rhine. When you had 16 planes, usually there were three groups of four below, and the top flight was called cover flight. And they usually weren't carrying bombs. They were just there to protect us from uh, enemy aircraft that we may not spot. You are alone, even though you're a part of a flight of 16 airplanes, you're still alone. You're the master of your own destiny. It's an exhilarating feeling. Waiting in the skies was the Luftwaffe, desperate to stop the American army at the Rhine. Diving at high speeds from above the Thunderbolt formations, violent dogfights would suddenly begin between planes barely 150 yards apart, firing over 100 bullets a second. I knew when I'd see tracers going from behind my plane in front of me that he was behind me somewhere and I was bound this wasn't going to happen and I thought oh buddy you have had it you picked the wrong guy today and I nail him and then go look for somebody else. If we're dogfighting yeah, it is exciting I could see these planes coming from my right and I'm calling to my my wing leader to break right so we both break right at the same time because you always turn into them and uh, they were shooting and uh, that was the first time I realized you could hear their guns inside your cockpit so that's how close they were. I just happened to look up in my mirror and I saw this ME109 on my tail and I had a hundred hits before I realized that I was even being hit and I pulled up almost went into a stall and uh, that gives you an indication how fast it all happens. And you don't have much time to, to think about it. You're doing it really to save your life and, and get out of the gunfire. Meanwhile, under the cover of smoke, General George Patton was driving his US Third Army to the Rhine in a daring attempt to establish a bridgehead to the east bank of the river. The Rhine had been Germany's natural defense line since Roman times. Patton was about to attempt what Caesar had accomplished 2,000 years earlier, but no general since Napoleon. Another US Army, the 9th, had reached the Rhine three weeks before, but all its attempts to establish a permanent bridgehead across the river had failed due to strong Nazi resistance. Patton's plan relied on the fast Thunderbolts knocking out German resistance ahead of his advancing army. Supporting the Rhine River attack, it got so we would be flying maybe four ship missions and going out, you know, many missions. Uh, we would take two, maybe even three missions a day where we'd be going out and getting whatever targets we could that would stop us from going across the Rhine. Now, we'd, be, we'd have, sometimes we'd have a lot of targets, such as a radio station. Uh, other times we would be going in a front line support controllers and attacking targets for them. And that one town would not surrender and they uh, announced to the people uh, with loudspeakers, I guess, mounted on the tanks that they were given five minutes to surrender the town and that they never surrendered. And so we worked the town over and uh, after that we were finished. You can imagine maybe 50 or 60 airplanes uh, with 50 caliber rockets that town was level. I don't think there was a, a mouse left. Without air cover and with no place to hide, heavy German tanks proved vulnerable to airstrikes. In one 10-day period, over 500 were destroyed by air-to-ground fighter-bomber attacks. Advancing at speeds of more than 300 miles per hour, and as low as 50 feet off the ground, even individual German soldiers found themselves suddenly under attack from the Thunderbolts. Patton's gamble completely surprised the Germans, as well as President Eisenhower. Without firing even one artillery round, and under the cover of darkness, Patton's Third Army quietly crossed the Rhine at Oppenheim, south of Frankfurt, reaching the east back at 10.30 p.m. on the night of March the 22nd. 
The nocturnal operation had cost only 28 American casualties. The following day, Patton's tanks, troops and supplies streamed across the once invincible defense line. His fast-moving army spread out, encircling more than 200,000 German soldiers and taking them prisoner. Patton then ordered the captured soldiers to march through the city's main square as a symbol of defeat to the German civilians who were forced to watch. The German radar-controlled anti-aircraft flak was taking its toll on the American Air Force. Dozens of Thunderbolts were hit, wounding the pilots and damaging the planes. Landings became as difficult and dangerous as the missions themselves. So you would simply come down with your flight uh, below the, the tower and they would shoot a gun with a green light or red light and you would peel off one after the other and you would uh, literally go into a chandelle, which is like going upside down, drop your wheels while you're upside down and do a tight turn and come in, and usually you try to do it under one minute. Now, there was a reason for that. If each pilot did it in one minute, you can determine that you have 50 planes, they would be landing in 50 minutes if that worked out correctly. Fire and ambulance crews on runway alert waited for the planes to return. With most planes low on fuel and others unable to drop their landing gear due to flak damage, many pilots had to crash land often with disastrous results from ruptured fuel lines and unexploded bombs and rockets still attached to their damaged aircraft. The average life of a fighter pilot was, I believe, about four hours uh, as an average. But the, I think everyone was concerned with the tremendous losses in the, uh, the pilots. Uh, we had an abnormal amount of fatalities. Just analyzing how many pilots we were losing, it wasn't that I was gave up hope. I suppose it made me try harder subconsciously, but I just couldn't visualize myself coming back in, in the United States and stepping off a boat or a plane. I just couldn't picture it in my mind. You felt badly when one of your squadron mates got shot down, and particularly if you knew he was killed. I mean, you couldn't really dwell on it because that was it and it was gone. You know? I lost some friends and we would, we would uh, lose uh, three or four pounds a week. And uh, it seems like it was always one at a time. At the time, the air battle over the Rhine was the largest operation of the Second World War. On one day alone, March the 24th, Allied pilots flew 12,000 combat missions, more than were flown on D-Day 10 months before. We sent eight out and one came back. That was a bad, bad morning. And when the guy pulled up and taxied up, he stood up in the cockpit and emptied his 45 into the cockpit. He never flew again. They took him to the hospital. The quiet period we had uh, before takeoff on a mission was uh, something that was designed by some flight surgeon somewhere, but it was a very important thing. It was approximately five minutes long, and it enabled each and every one of us already strapped into our fighter plane uh, to uh, uh, re-sift and, and rehash our thinking and calm ourselves down to get ready for the task at hand. The first time I did it, I thought it was rather foolish. Let's get up and go. That was my attitude. Then after experiencing this quiet time once or twice, I realized how important it was. My whole attitude changed in that five minutes. And I imagined that it leaked over into the flight crews, the mechanics, the armorers, the other people. And they felt the same thing. It, it was sort of a feeling of peace, almost, that came across.
the times that you really didn't feel like you wanted to go on a mission, I suppose, is when they would announce at the briefing that we're going to hit an airdrome today. And, and a lot of pilots would just back out. They'd say they they're suddenly would be sick or something. Not many, but uh, the pilots that went through an awful lot. And you knew you were going to get hit. It's just not a, a, a guess. An assumption. It was an assumption. You are going to get hit. But how severe, you don't know. April the 16th would be the darkest day in the German Luftwaffe's history, when they were attacked by the Thunderbolts and their allied forces. The Thunderbolt squadrons of the 362nd Fighter Group targeted the Luftwaffe with devastating results. 24 German aerodromes were attacked with guns and rockets fired from altitudes of just 20 feet above the ground. Their air raids destroyed 270 planes on the ground and another 29 in the air, along with numerous hangars, flak gun emplacements and fuel tanks. After more than three years of war, which had cost thousands of fighter pilots their lives, the P-47 pilots of the 362nd would show no mercy. On April the 16th, the combined British and US Air Forces mounted one of the largest attacks on the Luftwaffe. 6,000 Allied airplanes targeted 40 aerodromes inside Germany. 2,000 fighter planes would take part in the attack. Their mission was to destroy the Luftwaffe once and for all. But German air bases were heavily defended by radar-controlled anti-aircraft flak guns. Many pilots and their planes would not return from this mission. Those that did carried with them the record taken by the mounted cameras. I have been conditioned to actually to hate the German army, the German military. And uh, this was brought about by some schooling in the service, I'm quite sure. Most of it was a uh, subliminal type of thing. But I, I wanted to, to kill. It gave you a sense of gratitude when we uh, hit an airdrome in one sense because it was payback time. These were the guys that were up there trying to shoot you down and we had a chance now to put them to sleep. And so in that uh, sense, it was a, a good feeling. peel off, first of all, and dive down toward the target, get the target in my gun sights, and then fire a preliminary quick burst to clear the guns and make sure that everything was working properly. And then when I got close enough, and I used to go as close as I thought I could, and they, they said uh, uh, they gave it a distance of several yards, but I tried to close a little closer because uh, I realized that although we had 1,800 rounds of ammunition, it went very quickly, and I might need it for something else. So when I got as close as I dared, then I would uh, pull hard on the trigger and give it all it had for about two or three seconds. That's all it's needed.
level attack, you would probably come alongside at about a thousand feet and then peel off down and, and come straight in on the target. And uh, at the time, you try and get everything leveled up and get the sight on the target and then give them the burst. That aircraft was one of the things we probably feared because there wasn't much control what we could do about it. And when they would set the guns on you with radar, you could hear it in the headset. It would go like that, you could hear it. And you knew that there was a, a dish down there that locked you in and they were getting ready to shoot. At the end of the day, 905 German aircraft and 40 aerodromes had been destroyed. Unopposed in the air, the Thunderbolts were unleashed over Germany. On April the 16th, 1945, the Thunderbolt fighter group and the combined Allied forces scored a major victory over Germany's Luftwaffe. With the front lines moving quickly eastwards, driven by tanks and infantry, the Thunderbolt fighter groups were ordered to move with them. Captured aerodromes inside Germany were to be repaired and used as forward bases of operation. When the Air Corps engineers arrived at Frankfurt to inspect an aerodrome, they were confronted with the damage that had been inflicted. What little was left undamaged by the Thunderbolt attacks had been destroyed by the Germans themselves, obeying Hitler's scorched earth policy throughout Germany. The Führer had vowed that if the Allies did overrun the Fatherland, they would inherit a wasteland. Luftwaffe planes were found destroyed by the dozens, crushed on the ground. Hangars, barracks, and supply quarters were still burning from recent air raids. The once powerful German Luftwaffe, which had struck terror into the hearts of people all over Europe for six years, was now a smoldering hulk of its former invincibility. Starved of fuel and spare parts, its famous fighter aces captured or dead. In six years of war, more than 94,000 Luftwaffe planes had been lost, and with them over 138,000 airmen. Runways and hangars were quickly repaired. The 362nd Fighter Group moved to their new forward airbase at Frankfurt, their fourth in 10 months. From here, the Thunderbolts would rampage over Germany for the next 18 days, attacking anything that moved. The final humiliating misery of Germany was about to begin. There wasn't exactly a fear of not coming back. We realized it was the possibility, it definitely was there. But your job was to get the target we were assigned and be sure that your wingman, or if you were the wingman, or the element leader or flight leader, took care of each other and to be sure you got back. That was our mission, destroy the target and get back. Finding targets of opportunity was the order of the day. Flying low to the ground over cities and countryside, Thunderbolt pilots would suddenly dive down on their unsuspecting targets, unleashing their 850 caliber machine guns, bombs and rockets. For the German army, there would be no place to hide. You 
you could see the whites of their eyes, so to speak. Uh, uh, whether it was troops or people on motorcycles or, or trucks or freight uh, cars full of ammunition or whatever, you, you could very quickly see what you had to shoot at. Anytime we saw a train, first guy down got to shoot the engine, the locomotive. And you could tell if you got a good hit because all the steam would come up from it and the train would stop. Then you would pick at it car to car, everyone would take turns until uh, you just about set the whole train on fire. Many of those targets were horse drawn vehicles being tethered by women. Those wagons were full of ammunition, and you start up your pattern, and it was a repeat pattern. You'd keep making pass after pass, regroup, start passing again, and you'd end up with 20, 30 horse-drawn vehicles splatter all over the road, and you'd watch the horses go flying 20 feet in the air when those 50 caliber bullets hit. It was just awesome, the power behind those bullets that and the roads would be actually red with blood. You did your job, but you didn't quite feel so great about it. Coming along, I happened to look down, and there was a bridge that looked like, like a viaduct, an old Roman viaduct bridge in a way, and it had a, a truck on top of it. So I thought I'd, I'd just shoot the rocket at that. And then after I started down, I thought, well, I might as well salvo all four of them, so I let all four go and uh, pulled up, because you don't see the rockets hit on the way down, and as I pulled up and turned around to see if I'd hit, well, the whole bridge was gone and the truck as well. I wouldn't start a dive bomb no less than eight, or maybe 10 or 12,000. Reason being, you come straight down with the aircraft. You release your bombs while you're in that vertical position, and then when they go, then the main thing you should do is get out get out of the way. The tanks were very tough. The Tiger tanks they had were really good. And they all carried, or most of them carried, a fuel tank behind them in a trailer. So what we would do is not worry about the tank, we'd hit the trailer and set it on fire. And if it came loose or whatever, then we would shoot the bullets right underneath the tank and they'd bounce up on from the ground or whatever row they were on or whatever up into inside the tank because they weren't armor plated underneath, but they were on top and on the side. So we still found a way to get in. napalm several times and uh, it was very effective uh, one of the places where we could use napalm to full efficiency was dropping a load of napalm on top of a panzer tank if the hatch was open of course uh, you can imagine what would happen if the hatch was closed the napalm would spread all over and immediately catch fire and uh, it would be like having uh, meat in an oven it would, it would, they would be roasted inside. You become part of the airplane. It's like putting the airplane on like you would a jacket when you get in it. You wear the airplane and you become part of it and you your pushing of the rudder and the throttle and the stick, it's all automatic, just like when you walk, it's just one leg ahead of the other one. You don't say, I'm gonna push this, I'm gonna do that, you just do it. Yeah, we 
we had many times where pilots were missing, that, we, that would be the time that you would dread the most when you'd get back into echelon for landing and there'd be one plane or two planes missing. It just stayed with you for quite a while. I never thought I'd return back home alive as a pilot. It just never occurred to me that I would. In fact, I had premonition that I would never come back. I just didn't think I'd make it. On May the 1st, 1945, the Thunderbolt pilots flew their last combat mission over Germany. Seven days later, the Germans surrendered. VE Day was uh, a big relief, you know, and then, then you knew uh, that you had a really good chance to get home. The problem was during combat, every night when you go to bed, the prayer I would say is, just let me make it through tomorrow so I can thank you for that day tonight because it was a one day at a time thing. And when we knew that it was over, it was a big relief. Of course, then we had another question right away, will I be transferred to the Pacific? And some guys were, and some weren't. While others celebrated on the streets of Paris, London, and New York, the Thunderbolt pilots still in Germany were quiet and reflective, amazed that they were alive, yet horrified by the death, destruction, and misery all around them, the legacy of the most costly war in recorded human history. Hundreds of thousands of German war orphans were living on the streets as beggars, while millions of liberated refugees and concentration camp prisoners from all over Europe awaited transportation back to their homeland. Throughout the continent, German soldiers were made to walk back to their defeated country. German prisoners started to march through. There were hundreds and hundreds of German prisoners and you could look the way their shoulders were sagging, their heads hunched over, they were a beaten army, and they just had no strength, their morale was down to zero, and uh, it was not a pretty sight to see, and there were so many, many amputees with either an arm missing or leg, heads bandaged. Throughout the war, a fighter pilot never saw the face of his enemy, only the face of the country. The end of the war finally brought them properly face to face, to see for the first time the people they had fought and the damage they had inflicted. In May, the columns of soldiers stretching for miles began their long march back to Germany from every corner of Europe. Six million soldiers walked down many of the same roads and through many of the same towns they had conquered five years before. But this time not as the victors. It was a bitter end to a bitter war. A thousand-year Reich had been destroyed in less than a decade. The death toll in the Second World War was higher than in any war of recorded history, an estimated 55 million. The European war that ended on May 8, 1945, had been a total war on land, at sea, and in the air, fought by the armies, navies, and air forces of over 20 countries, waged mercilessly on civilians. For all the battles fought during these terrible war years, more civilians died in the conflict than soldiers. The defeated Germany these soldiers returned to was in ruins. Not one family had emerged unscathed.
but victory in the air had come at a terrible price. 18,000 US fighter planes and bombers were shot down over Europe, taking the lives of 80,000 pilots and crew. During five years of air raids on Germany, Allied aircraft dropped almost three million tons of bombs, killing 600,000 German civilians. Five million houses were destroyed, leaving 20 million people homeless. The 50 largest German cities were reduced to hollow walls and rubble. Transportation and communication systems had ceased to function, as well as all levels of government. Hitler's total war had brought Germany utter destruction and shame for the crimes of the Nazis. When you see the destruction at the end of the war, I mean, you can't believe how anyone could have done that and, and how anyone could have lived through it, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's so complete destruction that it, that it kind of boggles your mind to figure how, you, how people could have survived that, yeah. I miss the uh, camaraderie, the action, the flying, the, uh, the purposeness of missions and, and the, uh, the sudden uh, ability to get something done. And uh, I don't find that as much in peacetime. Uh, we were all friends with everybody in the squadron. And we had a, a feel of almost of uh, brotherhood because we were involved in exactly the same business, each of us. And the only thing that separated one from the other was the length of time. How long were you able to stay alive? We trusted each other implicitly. There was never any even suggestion of someone who could not be trusted or someone. In other words, I would put my life on the line for somebody else and they would do the same for me. Long ago and far away I dreamed a dream one day And now that dream is here beside me Long the skies were In the conquest of the Reich, the Thunderbolt pilots of the 362nd Fighter Group flew more than 3,000 combat missions. For their bravery, the group was awarded a presidential unit citation. But half of their pilots had been killed, captured or wounded, and 48 Thunderbolts had been destroyed. The remaining planes were scrapped in the following months. Of the 15,000 made during the war, less than 10 are still flying today.